Okay, so now we're going to take uh, some time to discuss the economy, where it's going, where it's been, where it should be going. Um, and so uh, we're lucky to have two great guests to talk about this. Um, Tom, I'm going to start uh, to you with a general, uh, a very open-ended question, which is how would you assess President Trump's uh, economic record so far? Well, when you talk about economics, you always talk about compared to what? Uh, certainly the first uh, part of his term uh, was a fundamental uh, turn in a different direction. We had spent eight years uh, with uh, economic growth that struggled occasionally to stick its head through 2%, but generally ran below that. And, all, and a lot of the things that were discussed just a few minutes ago as I was listening um, contributed to that in a positive, moving away from that in a positive way. And, and in the early going, uh, there was a great increase in manufacturing, there was a uh, increase in economic growth. Uh, there was uh, a lot of uh, complication about trade, but generally things got better. Uh, right now, um, we're in a sort of a cooling off period. And there's a lot of people running around saying, you know, it looks like we might have a recession. Now, I've been in Washington for the 40 recessions that were predicted in my tenure, of which only four happened. Um, but I do think manufacturing's back to uh, closer to where it was in the previous administration. So the real question, I think they did a great job in regulatory um, reduction, mostly getting rid of all the duplicative stuff. We helped them. And I think the tax, um, the tax bill in real terms and perceived terms had an effect in uh, making a lot of things operate better. So the real question you want to ask going during the sessions here is we know where they are, now where the hell are they going? Um, there's great opportunity and there's tremendous amount of distraction. The first thing we'll hopefully do is in the next days uh, get the uh, U.S.-Canada-Mexican agreement, which we negotiated and we all signed through the House and the Senate, that will have a very significant effect on the economy. Now, uh, Juan, it, it just, um, just to follow up on something quickly, you had mentioned we sort of, you know, helped with the regulatory reform. Could you just elaborate a bit on how you helped? Yeah, we did all the research and handed to the White House. So from my perspective, before I became the president of AI, I focused on issues concerning the lowest income Americans. I, I'm a poverty, poverty uh, a public policy expert. And um, from that perspective, the last three years have been outstanding. There's nothing better for helping people move up and out of poverty than an economy that is as strong as it is right now. Uh, I've been in this for 25 years, and uh, the, the wind at the back of helping people at the very bottom get into jobs. We have now many more jobs available than there are people actually seeking them. We have historic low unemployment. Uh, we have wages rising at the bottom faster than they are in any other part of the sector. Um, that's great. That's all good news. And I think it's unfortunate that it's often underestimated uh, or underappreciated. Uh, if you're going to try to help people who uh, want to take advantage of the great free enterprise system we have in the United States, an economy like the one we have now is as, almost as good as it gets. Uh, so I think the record is strong. I think regulatory reform has played a role. I think greater emphasis on manufacturing has played, played a role. A lot of manufacturing jobs grew. They've slowed down a little now, but still higher than they were at the end of the previous administration. And the tax cut. Uh, you may have written the regulatory reform, but economists at AEI helped write the corporate tax reduction. And an economist at AI went to be the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett. So um, I have to be careful because I'm, I come from a, you know, I'm not an economist and I have a lot of scholars at AI that are economists and they like to remind me to stay in my lane. Uh, but from the perspective of someone who cares about people at the very bottom, uh, this is as good as a couple of years as you could possibly have. I agree with that. 
Now, on the, the tax cut and particularly the corporate side of that, um, that's something that conservatives for a long time uh, had pushed for because the U.S. tax rates were globally uncompetitive. Now that we've been able to observe some of the, the effects of the corporate tax cut, they, they're sort of reignited this debate over the <clears throat> tax cuts because there are uh, critics of it who say that it, it just increased corporate profits and went to share buybacks and that didn't actually spur on the economic growth and uh, produce the jobs that were promised. And clearly, this is going to be a big issue in 2020. Democrats want to repeal it. Um, could you talk a bit about what you've observed from the corporate tax cut? Well, the only thing I would say before we turn it to Tom is that it wasn't just uh, you know conservatives and Republicans that wanted a corporate tax cut. Uh, President Obama wanted one, too, and he didn't get it done. And it was the absence of a corporate tax cut was preventing American businesses from being as competitive and as being as aggressive as they could be. So I, 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 have, I think AI scholars are very positive about that and its contribution to the stimulation of the economy. They're less uh, positive about the other parts of the tax code that um, uh, made the cost on the revenue side higher than they would have been comfortable with. We do have a problem long term with making commitments that we don't seem to want to pay for. And, uh, and there's two ways to tackle that. One is to find revenues, and the other is to find cuts. And we're not finding any cuts. President Trump has made it clear he's not interested in an entitlement reform. So from that perspective, long term, I think that's a concern. Um, so that's how I'd react to that. Uh, first of all, as you introduced it, uh, and as your team wrote it, it was the fundamental reason for that tax cut was to help corporations. You call it, we call it a corporate tax cut because the corporations needed to move forward in an aggressive way if we wanted to create more jobs, if we wanted to see more economic growth, if we wanted to continue with what we're really great on, and that's innovation, and to be competitive. And from those reasons, in those measurements, it was an excellent uh, bill, and it still is. Now, there are lots of people that want to measure against that corporate tax cut that we take care of all sorts of other things, including some individual uh, improvements that uh, were not uh, considered in that uh, developing uh, the fix we needed to get companies moving. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the measure that the press put on it is, uh, well, how many uh, people did you give a raise to? Uh, how many new jobs did you create? And don't, don't buy back any shares or don't pay any bigger di dividends because those people don't need it. Well, first of all, it's those people's money. It's not the it's not the money that belonged to anybody else. Uh, we, in public companies, and in the private companies, it's the owner's money. But in public companies, when we start uh, deciding what we're going to do and how much tax we're going to have and, uh, and how the company is going to perform, which we hope will create more jobs, we hope will create better opportunities for people, and we sure hope uh, that it'll help the whole economy go because everybody goes with it. And, but, but this is what's going on in the media now. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons with all of our technology, when you see uh, the competitive, uh, particularly uh, the cable networks, if, if one guy gets a story and puts it out, all the next person has to do to try and get there fast enough is write a headline and, and put a couple of sentences and they think they've done something and very often they didn't get the joke. You know, it was about something else. You were. The, the, the point is, is that economic stewardship of the Trump administration is their best card. Uh, if, they, if they focused on a message that said, go the other way and the economy will be wrecked, I think that would have a great appeal to the American people because the economy is very strong right now. And you can't go anywhere in the country and not run into employers that say, I can't find workers. 
That's a lot better. It has its own issues, its own problems, but it's a lot better than not having jobs to offer people. And so, you know, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, we get distracted in Washington from other less important, two other less important things, far less important things than the strength of the economy. The other two things about the tax cut, and I know for this crowd, I don't know exactly how this will play, but for AI scholars who like to get sort of interests out of the tax code, the elimination of the mortgage interest tax deduction, which I can remember coming to Washington and someone saying, that will never change. The powers that be will never let that happen. That's a big thing. And the re reduction in the state and local tax deduction, also very big reform. So I, I you know, I, I, the Democrats will say all the things they'll say. And Americans will look at their back pocket and see that they have more money in, in their wallets than they did in the previous administration. Now we have um, one question uh, from the audience um, right now, which is, uh, one is, how do you inspire the government to support research in advanced manufacturing, such as 3D printing and nanotechnology? You want that one, or do you want me to take no, that one? one? <laughs> you go first, and then I'll straighten it out. Well, I think that's good. I, I like that idea because, again, I'm you know I'm just a former uh, uh, anti-poverty fighter who happened to be made president of AEI, so I have to be very careful in straying into territory I don't know. Oh, go but, on. But I will say I do say I will say that that um, um, the the long-term effect of the reduction in manufacturing employment in the past 25 years in the United States was ignored for a long time. I'm sorry to say that, but it was, we didn't pay enough attention to it. President Obama didn't, the previous administration didn't. And I think in the election of President Trump, we saw that the American people didn't like that very much. Whether it was automation or offshoring or China, uh, 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 excessive uh, uh, unfair trade practices, whatever that caused it, undermined a, a path to middle class wages that working class Americans relied on. And so um, my view at a, my view, my personal view, whether it's in skills development or tech, career and technical education development or efforts to stimulate and promote manufacturing employment in the United States through job owning. The president is a great fan of job owning and encouraging American companies to locate in the United States. I think that was desperately needed and, and, and called for. Um, AI economists wouldn't like mandates, and we certainly are generally supporters of free trade and giving corporations a lot of freedom, but I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking about ways to restore a manufacturing base in the United States because there are a lot of towns and cities that really can benefit from having a, a factory in their community. In fact, there are about 400 towns and cities in this country um, who've lost their last manufacturing uh, location or their last uh, uh, warehousing or op operation or their last repair system. Uh, part of that came from the, our great uh, uh, universities where we uh, taught the MBA students a great deal about supply chain management. <laughs> and it made all the sense in the world. I'm building cars in Ohio. Why do I want to go all the way out to Oregon for somebody to make seats, you know? And, and they applied this, but not, uh, not in the best way. And that's about the last workers that are still around. And we're working on ways that you can sort of think about those places in clusters of three and four and then go locate if you can't get the workers, and these are people that can't move. I mean, they're frozen there because of their age. They, they've, they've got a house that nobody's going to buy. They've got four years left on the mortgage, and they're not going to move any place they've never been. So if you can't, you know, uh, you bring them out, and, and uh, we're going to try and get to some of those places. Uh, but one thing is to remember, with all of this trade, and all the arguments about what should we do here and what should we do somewhere else, 95% nah, of the people that we want to sell something to don't live in the United States. 
And so if we get totally, uh, we're going to do everything inside our borders, it's going to be very lonely. And not only are we not going to be in a position to have as many people working and have as strong an economy or the amount of uh, ingenuity and creativity, but we're not uh, going to be a player in the, the system that protects us um, in many, many ways, both economically and in terms of our, our national security from the rest of all of those people getting together and following uh, systems that all of us find not very helpful. Now, uh, um, in terms of President Trump, obviously he's been, he won as a populist, as a sort of a non-conventional Republican. Some of the stuff that we've talked about, such as on tax cuts and regulations, are policies that you could imagine uh, theoretically a Mitt Romney or uh, Jeb Bush even signing tax cuts and pursuing regulatory reform. But the two of the areas where there's been a, more of a split between Trump and the business community has been on trade and immigration. Um, could you talk a bit about your members and how they sort of perceive those issues and why that's kind of a contrast from a lot of where Trump's base is? Where do you want to start? Which one? Um, I mean, you could take trade or immigration first, whichever. Um, let, let's talk about trade first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and immigration is really important to talk about. You, and you, we've sought it in yep. the facts you've been talking about. So the trade issue is, um, let, let's, let's, let's hit it in four places. First, the, we had to redo the Mexican-Canada-U.S. Uh, trade relationship uh, agreement because of the tr changes, significant and positive changes in the trade facilitation worldwide agreements. Uh, we had to do it uh, because, uh, uh, because of the massive changes in how automobiles were made. By the way, when we negotiated the first NAFTA agreement, I was there. I played in that deal. That's all. I'm so old, I don't count numbers anymore. I sort of buy in other ways like, you know, vintages. And, <laughs> but when we did the first NAFTA agreement, we didn't have an internet. That's how, but it was only 20 some years ago and, and look what's changed. Um, and this agreement, while well, everybody was screaming and yelling uh, for their political purposes after we did the first one, this agreement has driven together three countries in a way that we now have collective energy independence, we have collective border security, uh, we have pretty good geopolitical agreements and relationships. And I'd much rather be in that circumstance than they were, were, that we could be in other places. And I would say in the next two weeks, we've all signed the agreement. In the next two weeks, we'll get it through uh, the Congress, or we'll have the agreement, and they'll just be looking for a day they can vote on it. Now, uh, the, the second set of agreements um, is the China deal. Now, if you have about an hour and a half, we can yeah, talk yeah, about that. that. But the fundamental issue to think about is that China has 1.4 billion people. If we're stretching the, the, the Alaska a little bit, we've got uh, 400 and some million. It, it, we say it's 300 and some, but I, you know, you figure this, in, you guys before were talking about migration as opposed to other forms of immigration. In July, um, 140,000 people, it was the first time we really had a major migration issue, walked into the United States. So um, the big issue to understand when you're talking about China, it's huge. And they have a whole new view on life, and they want to be competitive, they want to be dominant, and they want to, um, 
operate in ways that we don't all agree with. But everybody wants to sell them something. You got to be careful selling them something. After a while, they figure out how to make it with all your designs and then tell you good luck. Uh, but there's no question that we have to be clear about our trade because we have to figure out how we're going to do our geopolitical relationship. I give Trump a ton of credit for saying we've got to pull those guys up short and, you know, tell them what we've got to look at. And we even sort of winked and said, go ahead, use some tariffs to get their attention. Now, during all of this, you know, the NAFTA deal and everything, he found a lot of creative ways to use tariffs, which I would caution that they're going to come back and bite us. But, but the bottom line is, with China, it's not only the question of they steal our intellectual property. If you're going to do a joint venture, they want all your technology. They don't want to let you into deals where they want to keep no competitors allowed. And I shouldn't get into a lot of this, but they're even found many, many more creative ways to steal our most valuable technical, technological secrets in military and, and national security. So all of this puts us in a position that you got to be strong with them, but on the other hand, uh, you, you, you want to be careful. I would yeah. say one last thing, and then on this, and then we'll, you take China, and then we'll go back to some other <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, we'll go with immigration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but just one other thing. Um, it, it's really, really important that, that while we're being tough guys, we're, we're understanding that she, who became president of China, and thought he had it all made because he did his two terms and is going to stay for life. He's got more problems than we do. He's got lots of problems with his business community. He has lots of problems with the elders. He's got a big problem in Hong Kong. But their religious principle is 6% 6 6 economic growth. They announced they made it. But he probably meant in two years. But they've got a real problem. and. It's not, it's not something we want to cheer about. We have to find a way to coexist, and it's really, really important. But I applaud the president on being tough on this deal. Nobody wanted to be tough. The business community wants to get on with trade, uh, and we need to straighten that out. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the sentiment I think I hear you're saying, which is, is that it's good to be tough and it's good to – to lay down the law and, and go and challenge China, but we ought to be careful, uh, and the tariffs are uh, a long-term mistake. And I think that uh, that AI scholars and we would be very, in the beginning, we had a, a, Robert Barrow, the Harvard economist who's also associated with AI, was very positive about the Trump administration economic policies, and he discounted the risk of a real trade war because he thought the president was, his bark was, was much stronger than his bite would be. And more, more recently, he's now become concerned that the bite really had bite, and that he's he may go through with the raising tariffs and a real full-fledged trade war, and that's a real big risk for our economy, and it's not something that we should be you know kidding around about. I I, I think it's the one thing that could under you know it's one large thing that could undermine the president's economic uh, successes. And I get the feeling from you as I listen to this, you'd like the NAFTA deal to get done, the redeal, and you want a China agreement. You were encouraged a couple weeks ago when they said phase one was done. That was good. That relieves uh, a, a lot of anxiety. That is a, a real potential serious risk for American economy. Um, now, while on there, China, um, a few follow-up questions. One comes uh, from the audience, which is about um, whether the global competition with between U.S. and China will result in the supply chains getting more segmented so that it's not as much, you know, the supply chain between the U.S. and China, but sort of somehow segregated. Well, what's, what's happening with all of the the conflict with China, the supply chains are changing right now. 
And uh, because many companies who are trying to figure a way, not only U.S. companies, but others, to, to keep up their trade relationship with the United States are moving down the street. Yeah. They're going to, you know, to Vietnam and Cambodia and all that whole string of places. Um, and so the, and some of them coming back here, um, but when they get here, they got a problem because they haven't got any people. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I think we have to be very, very careful to understand that this is a global integrated supply chain. And that's a place, and people think that's how you send your products. That's a small part of it. Supply chain is how you get all your raw materials, how do you get your energy, how do you, how, how do you set up the places you're going to do it, what do you do with your transportation, which is another problem. And that's probably one of the most uh, massive improvements in, in global trade is the ability to do it. And, um, and, and by the way, we designed it. And I don't mean we, the chamber, I mean we, United States universities and companies and, and organizations like your own. I don't have much to add to the supply chain issue except that it's happening. People are moving their, their companies. It's disrupting business. It's making them unsure about their future. And that's, that's what happens when you start a, a trade war. And that's a concern. Uh, I also, I want to reiterate, I think, what you mentioned, Tom, which is the extent to which China is a huge market for American businesses as well. And it, it's not just nothing that we would suddenly have to not have that market available to us in various areas. The farming community is, you know, would really benefit from getting this resolved, for one, but there are many others. Now, um, one other question I have, which is sort of related to this, which is something that worries me, is that for a long time, because America was the superpower, um, it also was, was? A, well, well, no, I'm just saying when we were sort of the sole economic superpower, um, the, um, the issue, but the, the issue was that our, it, it basically helped us advance also our ideas, the idea of more, uh, you know, being more democratic and more liberal and so forth. Um, and yet we now have, because it was sort of, do you want to go the way of the Soviet Union or do you want to be successful like America? If you want to you know, be successful, you have to be more democratic and, and have more free speech and et cetera, et cetera. China obviously has pursued a different model. Um, as their economy has grown, they're still very repressive. Um, and in many ways, they've used that uh, economic power to try to advance their values. And certainly, we've seen incidents of American businesses feeling like they have to keep their mouth shut or you know, sacrifice American values in order to gain access to this giant market. Um, what do you think about that, given the sort of what you talk about, the importance of them in the global economy to the supply chain in terms of um, our trade with them, how do you balance those two things without having uh, our Im essentially importing our values, importing their values? Um, it's a complicated question, yeah. but my fundamental view is you, you got to stick with your principles. Um, I'm very troubled if you look around the world right now how many how many uh, states and countries are shifting because of economic challenges in part shifting their forms of government to more uh, uh, doctrinaire or less democratic institutions and if that keeps up for a while that's going to be a big problem we spent a long time after the second world war trying to um, create those institutions around the world. Um, and maybe we got so busy about it, we, uh, in our own country, we lost some of the 
the concern for the fundamental values that, uh, that are uh, critical to our great economy and to uh, our, our well-being. Now, well, I, I think we lost our confidence. And I don't think we really needed to lose our confidence. I think our economy is still strong. It's still producing more opportunity than any other economy in the world. It's far bigger, uh, and our standard of living is far higher than China's. And we have a scholar at AI, Michael Strain, who's going to come out with a book next month called The American Dream is Not Dead. And he's going to show in a whole series of statistics that this business that, that we've somehow fallen to the wayside and are no longer the leading system of, 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 of of government in the world because we provide the greatest opportunity for human flourishing anywhere in the world is the, the fact that that's somehow gone away is just not true. And I think there's some guilt on both sides. President Trump is not, uh, and Republicans aren't, aren't, aren't immune from this uh, concern that they, they talk down the strength of our country more than they should. Similarly, of course, the left always has done that. But I think we need to get our, our confidence back and when it comes to you know uh, uh, conceding on our principles because of we're, we're worried about China's economic power, that that's appalling. That's unacceptable. I mean, uh, we should talk about the minor religious minorities in China that are just that are are, are being put in concentration camps, uh, and we should stand up for the people of Hong Kong, and 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 not never give in on that sort of thing. You know, uh, fundamentally. If you want to play a weak hand all the time by bowing to their upset about something, saying something about, you know, and some N NBA guy says something they don't like, well, tell them, right, we'll, uh, and, and the NBA, I understand them. This is a huge growth issue. It's a great growth issue for many U.S. industries, but if we don't do it and we're not there, uh, and if we don't play, it's not going to be easy for them. And my basic view is I, I deal with the Chinese a great deal. I have a long history of it. And I'll tell you one thing. They respect strength a lot more than they respect, you know, wiggle. Yeah, I, I want to reiterate. We have a scholar at AI, Oriana Schuyler Mastro, who writes about China defense policy. And she believes that our failure to just stand strong with them has given into, has been a misperception of how they behave. They respect a pushback. They don't really want conflict. And, and when we're not standing strong, we're inviting uh, them to push a little further, and, and that's what could lead to problems. Now, we, we, I sort of started bringing up immigration, and obviously this is one uh, area where the chamber and President Trump don't see eye to eye. Could you talk about immigration from the perspective of businesses? Let me just go back one sentence on the same subject. But, you know, I, I said to you before, one of the things you have to think about while you're thinking about trade, that 95% of the consumers don't live here. Uh, and, and I'm going to say something about immigration, but it has the same tone to it. And that is facts lack, louse up every decent political argument that people have ever been in. I mean, who was it? Ronald Reagan said, you know, you can have all the opinions you want. You can't have your own facts. So, so the one fundamental issue, and I'll grant you that this is 3% hyperbole, and I'll explain it. We're out of people in the United States. We have eight and a half million jobs begging for people. We've got about 700, 7 million job, people looking uh, for jobs. And it's not that they're not trained. They may be in places that they're frozen and can't go to where the work is. Or they may be unfit for work. And, um, you know, it's really something that we need to think about. That, you know, our education system, we spend more money on education than anybody in the world. And our, our, our course, our colleges and universities are pretty good. Uh, but the whole idea of the U.S. education system is 
that by the third grade, you learn to read enough to learn, and by the sort of fifth grade, you, you're really getting your comprehension up and all of that. Well, two years ago, uh, they had numbers. They're not counting them anymore. Didn't like the numbers, so stopped <laughs> counting them. Yeah, yeah. And, and only about 32% of the kids in our schools, public and private, uh, got up to the, at the end of the third grade, I can read. So I didn't like those numbers very much. So I rationalized it and I cooked them up for myself. I said, well, you know, they'll do the fourth grade, we'll have a better teacher. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and I said, let's tell me what happens when kids are getting out of grammar school and going into junior high or whatever. And by the way, we, you could make an argument, only because I made it up, you can make an argument that 50% of them have qualified as we want them to. What about the other 50? Right. The, the other thing that is, uh, goes to this worker issue, which is a big one, is that um, we still have public assistance programs that provide a, a level of assistance that makes staying out of work still possible or easier. And I have spent my career trying to bring work requirements into programs like Medicaid or food stamps or social security programs, housing, because in programs where I've seen work requirements come into play, where someone has said who seeks assistance, well, we'll provide assistance, but you need to do something too. You need to go and look for a job. You need to go and participate in a program that will get you a job. You need to go and participate and training program. And I think while there's been some effort in that regard in the Trump administration, in Medicaid and in pilots around the state, uh, not enough. And we have to do more of that. Our public assistance program still allows people to be uh, sort of talked out of going into work uh, when, they don't re when, they, when they really should be moving into work. So I'm, I think there's some progress we could make there. Uh, the second thing is on training. I, uh, we, we believe that there are two areas of education that we do particularly uh, poorly in the United States, or there's opportunity for improvement. And one is post-secondary career and technical education. We've made some progress there, but there's been way too much of an emphasis on a four-year college degree and not enough on getting skills for the, the jobs in the current economy. And that's gonna, a lot of that's going to happen at the local level. The president's done some things on apprenticeships. I think that's been good. Um, but that is a place for improvement that would help with the worker issue and also early learning. Um, there are things that happen with children, particularly children from very poor communities uh, who don't have the benefit of two active and involved parents, where a little intervention to get that child off to a faster start would help in the long term in a positive way. But all of that, if we did all of that, it's possible, and I think it'd be kind of nice if our economy continued to grow and prosper that we might still need workers and still be interested in having high-skilled um, um, high uh, workers and others come from uh, around the world. They invigorate our life. They bring uh, a certain spirit and, and a certain um, energy. And uh, I know that's happened. You know, New York City did a lot of things in the 90s. We fixed the policing and we changed welfare and we made the schools a little better. Um, but we also benefited from an influx of people that brought um, some vitality to the city that was desperately needed. So I think, I really hope, I, that the previous discussion was pretty discouraging. They all basically said, it, we don't know, we can't be solved. But it would be good for American economy if it was solved. Yeah, but let me give you some reasons that it's gonna get solved, some of it. First of all, we wanna keep as many of the smart people that we educate in our best universities, particularly we knew all these technology folks and everything, and people generally agree with that all we have to do is adjust the numbers. Then you have to go to the other end of the system. You know, when we started Social Security, the, a the average age in America, um, uh, or the average death age in America was 61 years of age. Yeah. Today, the average death age in America is 81 years of age. Uh, by the way, I'm more in favor of that than the <laughs> yeah, I previous. bet you like that. Uh, I bet you're pro, right. pro that change. So, but think about that. How are we, not only how are we paying for that 20%, but how are we caring for all those people? I spent a lot of time on board, board in the assisted living business. And the older they get, the more expensive it is. And we are in an absolute crisis in this country 
on, on putting enough people to work to take care of the elderly. Now, that's okay unless they start to enforce the law. And the law on the federal uh, supported programs, which are mostly uh, uh, in the more severe illness, but it, that's how they've tried to take care of everybody in nursing homes. They're not meeting their staffing needs. They could close a whole lot of them right now today, and then they'd have to go home and live with their, you know, Children. family. Um, in between, there's all kind of demand here. You know that it's the single biggest demand right now in, in the, the, the manufacturing, the construction? They need welders. A welder can, with, works a little overtime, make $120,000 a year in most places around this country. So the bottom line is we have to look at it, and I don't fight with the president on this. I fight with the people that work for him. Some of those people are as dumb as a you know, <laughs> fence post on this subject. Yeah, okay. And the big deal is we're going to fix it. It's the only thing I can tell you if you're sure we're going to fix, because when we run out of people, we cannot drive any more economic growth. By the way, I'm opinionated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, one topic that's on a lot of people's minds and we've already spoken about today is this sort of rise of socialism in the Demo clearly the Democratic Party is adopting positions that are well to the left of what even uh, Obama ran on. Um, so I'd like to take it from a bit of a different angle now that I have a, both of you. Um, if Tom, if you could talk about the how businesses are viewing this conversation when they watch Democratic debates and, and hear some of the things. And Robert, if you could talk a bit about what AEI is doing to present policy alternatives, because clearly uh, one of the reasons why some of these policies are appealing to people is they're addressing problems that people feel they have. And so what is AEI doing to sort of you know, counter that that idea from a policy uh, standpoint, if you, if you wanted to, to start. Well, what does business think? Well, you watch the democratic debates, and here's the, with, with, with the majority of the people, not everybody, the majority of the people is we have to give more and more and more people everything for free so they always vote for us and nobody else. And so we should have Medicare, you know, for free, education for free, uh, college and universities for free, and for every time they get and say one of those things, oh, and here's how they're gonna pay for it. And so I've got some people keeping a list of it. Uh, none of us have any money anymore. It's all gone. Every smart idea they have, if it's a little idea, <laughs> then we say, they say, we'll go and get anybody that makes $500,000 or more. I want to tell you, if you took all the millionaires' money and all of the very rich people's money that didn't quite get to a B, uh, you can take it once. It won't even take care of one year's deficit. And the minute you take it all, there goes the philanthropy. There goes the investment in small business. There goes the fundamental character of this country. And we ought to just tell them to kiss off. <laughs> that, is, that is not to say that there are not some pretty good people in the Democratic Party that, that share that view, that understand what that would do to the, to the economy, are worried about our national security, are worried about and I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal the one thing, more thing. One of the reasons we're having this going on is there are two things going on in our educational system that really worry me. We don't teach very much history anymore, and if you wanted to yeah. go, if, if you wanted to go look at today's history books in grade school and, well, first of all, they've all been rewritten, um, but, but they sort of start at the end of the Second World War. The second thing is, you know, we, 
we all probably are the age, and there are a lot of young people here, but, you know, we went to school, and somewhere they taught us civics. You know, there's three, three parts of our federal government. You know, complicated stuff. <laughs> they don't teach physics, I, I, civics anymore. I can tell you, you can go to great universities and, and talk to young people that have just started out, and they have very, very little knowledge of how, how our government goes on. We found a, uh, a little association that was going around trying to get the states to agree that, that they would, to graduate from high school, that you'd have to take the citizenship e exam that, yeah. that a, a, an immigrant would have to take to be a citizen. If you don't pass it, you can't graduate. We've got, then we sort of hooked up with them, we we're helping them. We got 33 states that have agreed to that. Um, now, some of them said we're gonna teach them the deal and make them take the exam, but I don't think we wouldn't let them graduate because then you don't get your money, you know, from the state. But, but we're gonna do this, and I know this, 10 of them at the other end, we're trying to get them to do it, be like pulling, but we'll embarrass the hell out of them. You know, we'll take all the others and do a lot of good stuff, and yeah. that's it. So one of the best things that Carl Rove said earlier was that you can't just respond to this idiocy with saying it's idiocy, idiocy and, and not taking it on and taking it seriously and coming back with fact-based empirical arguments based on history, based on experience in other failed socialist countries based on what's happened when other efforts like this have been made, based on data. And that's what we do every day. That's what AEI scholars do, and that's one of the charges that I've given them. We have to uh, take this uh, seriously and as if it really could lead to very serious damage to our country. And uh, that's what we'll continue to do. The second thing that we do is we, have, we do have an extensive effort in college campuses and with, uh, community, um, and with groups around the country where we bring our scholars out and try to turn the tide, especially with young people, to the extent we can against this sort of in increased interest in socialism. So we don't just write a paper, we actually take ourselves to places where we can have direct uh, 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 contact with people so we can persuade the country. And then the last is, and it goes to this last point that Tom was making, is that AI had gotten a little bit away from an old history of studying the underpinnings of American society, what makes us great our constitution, our social and cultural underpinnings, our faith. And we've recreated a new center, Social, Culture, and Constitutional Studies, and we're gonna go at those fundamental points about the importance of the individual versus the state, the importance of our three uh, branches of government, separation of powers, federalism properly understood. And if we uh, don't make those arguments in that serious way, we are running real risks in the country, and we intend to, do, to fight back. Good for you. We'll help you. Yeah, there you go. We're together. We're together. Uh, now, we touched on this briefly, kind of alluded to it in uh, some of your answers, but just to get more direct, um, there's been a lot of talk about a, the potential for a recession, um, and certainly some of the volatility we've seen in the market over the past few months and the actions of the Fed indicate that there are certainly investors uh, fearing this. Um, and Robert, you talked about how th right now the economy is sort of the strongest horse that uh, President Trump could ride to re-election. Um, so if you could talk a bit about uh, the, the sort of likelihood of, uh, you seem to be somewhat skeptical of it based on past prognostications of recessions, but I guess if, if you could just... The only thing I will say is that if uh, the, the general uh, view of the economists at AI is that the biggest risk is the trade war, and if it doesn't get resolved, uh, then there is a potential for damage to the economy that could lead to a recession sooner than we want. And if the trade war uh, calms down and, and resolution is met, then the, uh, there's no reason why the economy can stay out of a recession. Um, I think that's that's how we see it. The, the the biggest risk to the economy is is that, and both of these two things would be good news if the if the re rewritten NAFTA were to be 
uh, passed by Congress, that would be progress. And if whatever's happening now with China where they seem to be able to come to some resolution, where if we've made progress on things President Trump wanted to make, but China also has to have a, 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 a where there's a coming to uh, an agreement, that would send a positive message to the business community that would help us stay out of recession. Well, I think that's exactly right. I think the reason the president um, uh, moved a little more helpfully uh, on uh, getting everybody back to the table on the China deal and uh, uh, sort of when they started buying lots and lots and lots of soybeans, um, he backed off a little on some of the, uh, the tariffs. And I think the fundamental reason that he did that a very distinguished group of people yeah, went, and saw him. went in to see him. In fact, they were organized by some few people around the president. And they basically they didn't get in a big fight or anything with him. They just said, look, this economy is slipping a little bit in the wrong direction, and here are the five numbers. And that's all fine if that's what you want to do, but yeah. you're going to lose your ass in the election. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's easily how it went. But. And I understand that was exactly the quote. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the president's a, a practical man. And uh, he looked at that, and, uh, and so we're moving in a better direction. We pushed the deal when this thing was at a little higher crescendo and said, look, there's three things you do to, to sort of bring the numbers up a little. Not, let's hurry up and approve this uh, Canada, Mexico, US deal. It will give people confidence. I remember that word. And then the second thing is, let's get China guys back to the table. Let's start seeing the few things we can do moving ahead. That will give people confidence. And then for fun, because the, one of the biggest things in this country that we are sort of uh, not doing very well is fixing our infrastructure. And you don't want to ride down the street in, New York, in Washington without strapping up your seatbelt. You'll bang your head off the roof the whole time. We need to do basic things in our roads, our bridges, and the like. And a group of Democratic and Republican senators in, over in the Senate, of course, got together and voted 100% on a half of a half of an, Im, of an infrastructure bill, just roads and bridges and the, the, man, uh, repairing the light transit. And if you did that, uh, you, you A, create more confidence. And, and it wouldn't be the most expensive thing in the world, but they did it, they voted it 100%, but their committee wasn't in the business of approving the money. So they got a great idea, no money. Now I'm, um, uh, and please don't throw anything, mm -hmm. uh, I've been talking to people for a long time that it is 26 years since we increased our federal fuel tax. And in that period of time, there's nobody in this room that's driving a car that doesn't have better miles per gallon than the one you were driving 26 years ago. And so we're collecting a fraction of what we used to collect. The price of, of oil and gas and all is down. down. And if you simply one time added a quarter and, and fix it so you didn't have to run back and do that because you'd tie it to inflation or something, uh, if you did that, we could start tomorrow, start tomorrow in improving our infrastructure. There's a lot of other things we have to do, but we could just get into this thing, and that would give people more confidence. And when people have confidence, they invest their money. When they lose confidence, when they get frightened, when they're worried about their money, they sit on their money. And my view is, let's do the... Canadian-Mexican thing, let's work with the Chinese, tell them we're real, we're gonna help you, but you gotta get on the game, and let's go do a little infrastructure and we could stop all this worrying. I, I, I would say one thing that it is not helpful, or is not our first, my first priority, is the president's um, tendency to blame it all on the Fed. 
I, I think AI scholars do not find that to be helpful or useful, um, and uh, it, it's, just, it's a distraction. And I'm sort of curious about the Chamber's view of that. I think you underspoke. It is absolutely insane <laughs> to take on, look, there's two parts of the Fed, and one part of the Fed, I'm willing to go and have big battles with them and all that, and that's a lot of the regulatory stuff they do. But the central banking system that sort of holds it all together at a time when it could get difficult. And by the way, you immediately could say uh, what they did during the crisis, you know, where they, where they built, built up their balance sheet and all that, maybe that's crazy, but we didn't go under. And, and there is something very, very important about having an independent Fed, and that is they don't have to listen. After they're confirmed, they, don't, they have some independence. And, and I, I understand exactly what the president's trying to do, uh, but that's a dog that can turn around and bite you. Um, you know, I, I want to work in some more uh, audience questions. Uh, one of them we have is how do we take the efficiencies that we have in private industry and implement them in government? And the example given is, for instance, moving toward more online self-service as opposed to standing in line for things. Well, I, you know, I'm we're we're uh, skeptical of government's ability uh, to you know, suddenly wake up one day and figure out how to do things in a lot better, uh, honestly. Uh, the sort of recreation of government, reinventing government, we do that all the time. Um, that's not to say that we don't put, you know, some of our scholars put papers out that make specific suggestions in various areas. In the area that you just described, for instance, this is a, in the world that I come from, public assistance is a big world. Let's, let's make it all technology, let's all have it be online, Let's all just give people all the benefits they want without them ever having to come into an office. Let's to have them apply through the internet. We'll never see them. And you know what you do? You, you do reduce the staff, and you do shorten the application period, but you drive up the number of people that seek assistance, and you drive up the number of people who seek assistance and receive assistance fraudulently. Because it's just a fact. People are, it's a lot easier to lie to, to a computer than it is to come in and see a, a caseworker and apply for assistance face to face. So I, I get, a, in the world that I come from, this an intense desire always for efficiency, to reduce staff and accomplish something faster, has led to an explosion in dependency on public assistance, which I don't think is really in the long-term interests of, of our citizenry. So yeah, I, you know, I, and I will say one more thing about uh, the current administration. It's very hit or miss in the agencies that we found, is that in some places, for a variety of reasons, they've made very good appointments of creative uh, uh, public servants who come in and want to change things and make things better. In other places, there's no one paying much attention. And it's that's a, because there's no one there. Right, well, that's, that's, the, that's part of the problem, too. So I, um, you know, that's my... I, I would... Uh... I would very much agree with what you said. I would add, we want to be, now don't, we want to be very careful not to get a particularly efficient government. The most efficient government is a dictatorship. A government of the people that all over this country at every level of our society where we have people sponsored, people elected, people guided governments, we have inefficiency because we want it that way. When we, when we created our country, we decided not to have kings and queens. We decided to have balance. We also preserved a role for states, which, exactly. you know, which is important. How many people here, I can't see them all, how many people saw Hamilton? <laughs> well, if you haven't seen it, it's not as expensive as it was, but it is a great argument about how our country was founded. By the way, arguing about the same things we're still arguing now, but they're arguing about the independent 
protection of the citizens of this country to say, to let, just look at the first 10 amendments and what the Constitution said and what our Declaration of Independence said, and all of that assures not so much efficiency, but a lot of freedom, and we've got to keep a balance there. Um, now, uh, one final question to, to wrap up, um, which you've addressed some of this, but I think uh, it might be a good way of sort of wrapping up, is what changes in economic policy would you make if you were president today? Well, uh, I, I think I've, we've already sort of addressed some of those things. I would, I would try to drive toward agreements in the trade area and, and that don't give in uh, completely to China on fundamental points, but do try to recognize that we are a, a, a world in which free trade is mostly beneficial to Americans as well as the rest of the world. So that would be number one. Um, I, you know, I, I think long term, the failure of this administration and this Congress to face up to the uh, commitments they've made with regard to spending in Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security are pretty fundamental problems. And I'd like us to move in that direction. And we're not doing anything on that right now. And that is a, a tragedy. If I were President of the United States, I'd pray for America. <laughs> but seriously, I, I think in the current issues we're talking about, getting the trade agreement with the, our friends through the Congress, uh, working really hard to get away from a trade war and get into a trade fix, uh, I would go into some, um, some of the structural changes we have to make in our physical country, roads, bridges, and all of that, that would put the last of the people we have, in fact, we probably don't have enough people to actually do that work. Right. Um, let me just hitchhike on your deal about what would you do in a long-term run as president. Yeah. You know, I don't have this year's numbers. The federal government's um, end of the year is the end of September. So, but using last year's numbers, uh, at the end of September, you took a look, and if you took Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and interest on the debt, which was driven by the first three, you would find that you had spent, I believe it's 76% of everything the federal government spent in deficit spending too, you know, 76%. And this year will be higher yeah. because we have more of the collectors. Right. And, and this gets to the point, what are you gonna do with defense? What are you gonna do about education? What are you gonna do about housing? You know, what are you gonna do about all those things? Yeah. And, um, and I think it's a serious issue and then I, you know, a lot of people say, well, we have to change it, but we'll have to do it gradually. <clears throat> uh, I absolutely agree with that, but it'd be a good idea to have an objective that has a little more thought to it than we'll do it next year or the year after yeah. or the year right. after that, right. because it's 77%, 78%. Pretty soon there's not gonna be anything except Those entitlements, things. and we can't, afford that. We need to drive our economy and we need to build a vigorous workforce. I had dinner the other night with the Secretary of Defense. He's pulling his hair out because where is he going to get the people that he needs? And um, look, if we could do, I have one simple suggestion. Calm down, try and get a few more facts. Maybe take one day a week, which we don't throw rocks at each other yeah. from both sides of this political thing and sort of think about what we do to make this a better place to live, a better place for our grandchildren to grow up, and some place that's not going to find themselves in the same kind of a mess that you see at other places around the world. Okay, well, on that hopeful note, uh, <laughs> we're going to uh, wrap up. Thank you uh, both for your time. <laughs>